Welcome everybody to one of our Dean's seminars. I'm delighted to have Mary Wick from IBM today. Uh, she will tell us about blockchain and maybe something about the, the subtitle of the talk. Uh, Mary uh, has a degree in computer science from Columbia and also an MS from Columbia Computer Science and then an MBA from New York University. Uh, she has been in IBM for 25 years and in between Columbia and MBA she, uh, and IBM she was in Bell Labs. Okay? Uh, I asked her what's the size of the operation of people working in blockchain. It's a big chunk. I mean, we are big in here in McCormick. It's 4,400 people altogether. But w if you divide that in a third, that's the entire number of people working in blockchain in IBM. And she will tell us, I think you are going to hear the whole ledger many times, in something called the hyperledger, which is making all of these technologies available to uh, services or even developers. So with that being said, welcome, Mary Wick. Thank you. Well, I got one. So ju just to get us started, how many of you are um, cryptocurrency traders? Okay, not, not, not that many in, in comparison. Um, how many have done anything beyond cryptocurrency with blockchain so far? Cool, cool, that's good. Um, there are a few more seats over here, including we can have this one if you want to come in and sit down. Um, so a as you heard, um, we started with blockchain about three, four years ago in IBM. Um, we formed a unit in blockchain specifically, doing nothing but um, blockchain optimization um, and support for clients, and I'll talk more about that. Um, we have 1,500 people around the world uh, working on blockchain. Um, we can't get enough people with skills in blockchain, hint, hint, you know, keep, keep looking at that space. Um, and we're working with every industry, every geography all around the world um, on blockchain solutions. Um, no real common element. I'll show you some of the data. Um, but it's still very hyped and very misunderstood. And you know, just to start off on a little bit lighter note, um, you know, my view is you know you've arrived in a technology when there are Dilbert cartoons about it. You know, because you have now past the point of the hype cycle. This is now in uh, the common lexicon. And just about every weekend, there is a new article in the Times or whatever paper you uh, read on blockchain and or cryptocurrencies. Um, the interesting part, though, is it is still very misunderstood. And most people immediately think about it associated with the very first instance, which was around Bitcoin. Um, and Bitcoin News published a Deloitte study that while there are thousands of blockchain projects, only 8% of them are going to actually survive because there are so many. Um, and we've started seeing a pattern in some of that. I'll talk about that too. But even more food for thought. Um, this was as of February. Um, there are today... Um, 1,700 cryptocurrencies being traded on market cap. Um, so, you know, not just Bitcoin, 1,700 uh, that are in circulation and are being traded. And the market value um, of those companies was 422. The trading volume in total is approaching a trillion dollars. It was about 780 billion. Um, in the last couple of weeks in terms of the last year spent. So there's a lot of activity going on in what is um, blockchain and or Bitcoin. And all sorts of other headlines that this is going to be Internet 3.0 or that this is going to crash and burn and there's going to be a market correction. Um, 
it's going to be regulated. It's going to be, you know, the answer to net neutrality. You know, so the combination of topics and views has been pretty widespread. And we got into um, blockchain several years ago really focusing on is this the next generation of transaction systems. So at the time I actually ran our WebSphere and transaction businesses. And what we've concluded from that is it's no, it's really an answer to digitization and the process of digitization. And we did, I'll show some more data, but we did a study last year of almost 3,000 C-suite executives all around the world, um, 40 uh, countries, 20 industries, and pulled them on both what they saw as threats from a digital transformation perspective and what they were doing. And one in five were already explorers, was our definition, who were doing live projects on blockchain of some variety at that point in time. But two-thirds said that by this year, they would be doing work. And it's important to understand some of the history of what blockchain is and what blockchain isn't. But it is that digital transformation and digital disruption that got this all started. I mean, blockchain was the response to the financial crisis um, and the mortgage lending crisis of how would you create the same kind of model that you have in anonymous trading, real trading, in a digital world. You know, so if you go to a flea market and want to buy a vase, you make an assessment of, is that vase worth 20 bucks? Great, fine. You know the value of your $20 bill. You give it to the vendor. The vendor doesn't need to know who you are. You don't need to know who the vendor is. You've established a value proposition and a transaction. How do you do that in a digital world? Today, you cannot do that anonymously. You have some mechanism for knowing who you are, you know, your credit card, your wallet, regardless of whether you're using a mobile or some other um, system. And particularly if it is cross-border, cross-currency, cross-company, there are a lot more intermediaries that get in the mix that know you, know your identity. And the whole notion of uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, who's an anonymous person, um, who wrote the original blockchain, uh, Bitcoin, became the foundation of the Bitcoin algorithm, was I can solve for the elimination of the middleman or middlewoman. Um, I can solve for that broker and eliminate the broker and have an anonymous transaction digitally. And the big problem of having a digital transaction is the double spend problem. So if I have that $20 trade, how do you know digitally if there's no one in between checking and making sure you actually debited your account and credited it and went through all the ledgers that you didn't give me the say, you're giving me the $20, but say you're giving the next three people that same $20. So the whole problem that blockchain was trying to solve is this double spend problem. And very creatively done with a shared set of ledgers that I don't need somebody in the middle. I'm going to have all these participants engaged in order to prove through a model that in Bitcoin uses proof of work, just a mathematically hard problem to prove that this is a real valid transaction and package them all up and have an immutable ledger that proves that you have that transaction. So you're verifying it and you're copying it across many different participants. And that creates a opportunity not just to solve trades from a currency, cryptocurrency or otherwise, but opens up a whole lot of other opportunities. And if you look at the market today, you know, this notion that I can have anonymous trade is one whole category. And that that anonymous trade 
has a cryptocurrency associated, whether it's Ether or Bitcoin or any one of those other 1,700, are a whole category of spend. But because you now have this notion of a shared ledger that has consensus among a bunch of participants, you could use that for a lot of other things where data sharing gets involved. So when we think of the market around all the distributed ledger technologies, DLTs, as what these are often called, to me there is, some people call this public or anonymous, and then permissioned or private. And cryptocurrencies or non-cryptocurrencies. You don't have to have a currency to have exchange of data of any kind that could go on your blockchain, not just a currency. So we, when we started, Ethereum is the other probably most common um, use case for blockchain. It's underpinned by Ether as its cryptocurrency. It is a public network with a main net, and it allows you to do a lot of general purpose programs, but most of them involve a token where that token is translated to Ether. And in IBM, we started there too. Um, we looked at Ether, we looked at some of the use cases. I'll talk about a lot of them. Um, but we found some problems that we didn't like about um, Ether and Ethereum for general purpose enterprise use cases. Um, number one, most cryptocurrencies, not all, most cryptocurrencies are mined. That proof of work algorithm, and there have been lots of articles about how much energy consumption the mining is taking. About 40% of the spend on blockchain last year was on cryptocurrency mining rigs and um, custom ASICs and other hardware accelerators that let you win the math proof needed for proof of work. So a lot of the energy consumption, a lot of the effort, a lot of the spend is going into what we consider you know, make work. It, there are other ways of solving that, um, that double spend problem without mining. So we didn't like that aspect of consuming a whole lot of stuff without it having the value itself. We also, from an enterprise perspective, most of the clients that IBM works with want to know who they're doing business with. Um, and there are ways to provide privacy and security or confidentiality without being anonymous. So the notion of permissioning and actually having trust anchors of who you're working with, we think actually enhances the value of most blockchains. So we wanted something that was more permissioned. Um, we also didn't like the licensing model. We are absolutely for open source, think it has to be there for a new technology platform like this. Um, but it's, Ethereum is GPL licensed, and we wanted an open source and open governed model that would allow for adjacent technologies or commercially used technologies to not need to be contributed as well. So when you have a lot of work that's going on um, that touches that code, that all of that related code doesn't have to get passed through as well. So about a year and a half ago, we, along with about 30 other people, approached the Linux Foundation and um, started the Hyperledger project. Um, and Hyperledger is now has about 200 participants engaged. It's been the largest and fastest growing of uh, the projects in the Linux Foundation. And is starting to, to see a lot of traction in other places. There are other areas that are focusing on you know, permissioned, trusted blockchain. You can see some of them up there. Um, some also that are non-mined cryptocurrency related permission networks. We're doing some work that I'll talk about with Stellar um, and Stellar.org and that foundation to provide a currency if you need one in an example. But the market is really, you know, are you really looking at currency related trades or tokens or are you looking at other use cases that tend to be data that wants to be shared? 
And regardless of where you are in that landscape, all of the blockchains kind of have the same thing. Typically, all internet-based communication and other computer network models are really point-to-point, -point, you to me, through a broker, potentially. Even what are considered new, you know, new digital businesses, purely digital businesses, if you think of Uber or Airbnb, they are essentially a broker connecting point-to-point -point transactions between a rider and a driver or a car, you know, a bedroom and a guest. Um, so is there a way instead to create trusted networks? That's what um, the whole model behind Bitcoin was of, I want to connect those members themselves to each other without necessarily taking a cut out of each one of the transaction connections. And if there is a common use case, then that could be a really interesting model. So the whole notion is you have, blockchain is nothing more than a database at the end of the day. It happens to be a distributed database. There happen to be multiple copies of that database, and they're all copied to be synchronized and have consensus, so they share a common record. And you can have a whole lot of parties to that um, network once you've put that together. So that notion was the part that got us very interested. And there are a couple of unique properties that all blockchains have. I started with the first one. It's a shared ledger. Um, and the other interesting piece of that shared ledger is all blockchains have a notion of um, permanence in terms of their capabilities. They are immutable. Um, one of my colleagues uh, describes it as uh, writing the crossword puzzle in ink. So if you got the, the data value is a celestial body and you wrote in, you know, four across is moon, and then you decide later that four across should be star, in a normal database, you would replace the value of four across with star. In a blockchain, you would cross out the answer and append the new answer. So you will still see both moon and star. You will see how many tries it took you to finish you know, the New York Times crossword puzzle. But that has some other interesting aspects that allow you to trace provenance of data from its inception. And gives you opportunities in audit situations, in trust situations that you are sharing all this data and you see all versions of the data and therefore you do have a record. That's what helps you solve that double spend problem, but it can also help you solve a lot of other problems. And in the case of the permissioned or um, private networks, they do have a permissioning system. They all have a consensus algorithm of how you actually replicate and share the data in all the copies of the ledgers, which are usually called peers. And the actual transaction, you know, what are you doing on this blockchain network, is captured in code called a smart contract or a chain code. So in Bitcoin, that smart contract is a trade of cryptocurrency. In other networks, that smart contract could be a wide variety of things. And Hyperledger, and Hyperledger Fabric in particular, which is what we use, is a general purpose modular system where you can basically code anything. Um, supports Go and Java and Node.js, and you can basically take any general purpose programming language and code um, a blockchain chain code. In Ether, with Ethereum, it's Solidity. There is a, a limited set function, and you'd have to learn Solidity. You know, it's one programming language to another, not a huge variant, but it is a different course because they tried to make it very fit for purpose for the Ethereum network so that you don't have any variations in the model and the architecture. So in those places where you're now eliminating someone in the middle, where you're sharing data across, and where you're driving 
a network where everyone has access to that information at the same time, you typically wind up taking out time, reducing costs, reducing extra fees, and increasing the opportunity for net new business models. Now, in that same study that I mentioned, this was a year ago, the number one uh, set of use cases, not a surprise, was in financial services. Um, the single largest areas of spend and activity we're seeing are still in that same uh, approach, particularly around trade finance. You know, any use case where there are a lot of participants, long linear processes, um, most importantly, lots of paper. You know, so the two biggest areas that I see in terms of blockchain are anywhere there's a lot of paper, you know, think of mortgage process. Anywhere that there is a lot of players and anywhere now that you have to share that data, digitize it, put it on a blockchain. Um, but every area, you know, whether it's banking, healthcare, finance, insurance, um, there is a set of projects that are going on right now. Gartner did a study last year as well and looked at economic outlook and didn't do a normal market share spend kind of view, but they looked at what do we think new business model creation will occur, and they estimated $3.1 trillion of new economic value will be created from blockchain business models by the year 2030. And they likened it to the early days of e-business and the internet with new business models, you know, ad revenue business models, click-through models, all sorts of new capabilities because of the advent of a new technology. And we're starting to see some of those already. And examples that build off cryptocurrency, like uh, initial coin offerings and ICOs, tokens, um, you know, Kodak coin, are some of the ones we're seeing, um, but there are other new ones that are coming up as well. But the important difference, um, number one, these are networks. The whole value is in the network. It is not just in the technology. So getting all of the data on a topic that you are trying to work on and share information on, on that network is pretty important, which means you got to get value for all of the players to want to engage. And you have to make sure that they feel like they are in a trusted relationship. Now, to get all data from a given application on a blockchain, most of the time you're going to have to get competitors to want to do that together. That brings up antitrust regulation. That brings up confidentiality. It brings up all sorts of other things which is leading to some num number of new solutions that folks are working on as well. In Hyperledger, one of those solutions is the notion within a network of something called a channel. So imagine you're on a CB radio and you know, you're on channel 12. Well, you can't hear the conversations on channel 7. And when you're permissioned into the network, these subnets or channels can be established to say, OK, you know, yes, you'll see that a block was added to the chain like that crossword puzzle, but I won't be able to see any of the content because you're on channel seven. You'll just know that there were transactions. But if you're on my channel, you're gonna see the content, you're gonna see the transactions, you'll be able to participate. Um, but regardless, things are moving fast. And these are just some of the projects that we've been working on around the world. Um, Trade finance is the number one use case. You know, imagine, in fact, you know, you've got traders now. You've got a small manufacturer. You've got other folks. They need to get credit until they are paid um, while they're manufacturing their goods, while they're waiting for invoicing, while they're waiting for fulfillment. You know, those are some examples. Uh, an interesting one, Everledger is a, a company that we worked with they have created a way to digitize a diamond. So they have now 1.6 million diamonds on a blockchain network because every single one of those can be digitized now uniquely to identify them. And they're using AI to 
ingest the Kimberley Certificate, which is a UN mandate for conflict mineral trading, you know, that this is not a blood diamond, and test that as they put it on the diamond, and you can command a price premium. But their big new, you know, aspiration here was not just to get higher value for the miners in the goods that they would be selling, because they do command a premium if they're Kimberley certified, but now they're getting into insurance. You know, most people that have any jewelry get a rider on their homeowner's insurance at 10%. They don't insure an individual diamond, nor do they know what it really is worth. And if it gets stolen and they file a claim and it shows up in the pawn shop, you can't trace it back. But now I could have, you know, recovery services, I can have insurance services, and I can have a network model for this particular company. So really new and different use cases. Um, but one that we have done quite a lot on, which you know, most people don't think of from a blockchain perspective, is work we started with Walmart that has gone a lot further than that. Um, and it was with their head of, of food trust. And I have a short video of what they did, and then I'll talk about the technology under the covers. I purchased a pack of mangoes. I came into my staff meeting. I put them on the table, and I said, your trace back exercise starts right now. And we timed how long it took them to get the information for each point in the food system all the way back to the farm. And I'm not going to give you the results okay. <laughs> after the pilot. But we have, it's going to be good. <laughs> when a customer shops in our stores, we know they expect great prices. We know they expect fast, clean, and friendly service. But an unspoken expectation is that they expect the products that they buy in our stores to be safe. You know, when there's a food event or a food scare, what you want to do is you want to be fast, but you want to be right. That food product is guilty until proven innocent. We at Walmart will actually pull all of the products until we know what is the implicated product and we can put the safe product back out. And so imagine if we could pinpoint with certainty within minutes, not days, that it was the implicated product. Walmart and IBM are working to make that a reality. If you think about the food system, it's pretty complex. It involves farmers, processors, distributors. And the way traceability is done today, each segment of the food system does it their own way. Most actually do it on paper or on systems that don't speak to each other. And so you can never have a full view of what's happening in the food system. What we hope to do with blockchain is bring all food safety system stakeholders and collaborate so that we do it one best way. We can do it very quickly and efficiently. Blockchain is a digital ledger that allows different segments of the food system to capture information about the product, what they've done to it, where that product has been. If we're linking that data with other uh, data points, the Internet of Things, all that information will yield to insights that will allow us to have a safer, more affordable and sustainable food system. But we don't believe traceability is the goal. We believe that transparency is the ultimate goal. Blockchain will give us the ability to not only track where food came from, but how it was produced. Was it produced safely? Was it produced responsibly? Is it sustainably grown? How many dates of shelf life are left on that product? The food system is a shared responsibility, and for blockchain and traceability and transparency to work, we need a lot of people working together. And so we're excited to be working with IBM on this blockchain initiative. But it's not just Walmart and IBM. We actually have some of our suppliers participating in this pilot. We've got some universities also participating in the pilot. And so we'll make sure that all stakeholders work together for a safer and better food system. So a little bit of... Um I purchased a pack Oops. of mangoes. I came into again. my... A little bit of an infomercial there, but Frank Yanis, head of Food Trust. Um, first time I met him, he took out a picture of a little girl out of his wallet. You know, I thought he was going to show me his kids and, you know, stuff like that. It was a girl that was um, permanently injured with kidney disease in a foodborne illness um, as a result of a spinach outbreak that occurred back in the 2007-8 kind of time frame. Um, and it wasn't a Walmart <laughs> product, but you know he carries that around to say that's why I'm doing this. 400,000 people a year die 
from foodborne illnesses, and one in six worldwide have an issue every year. And there is mandated regulation on tracking food safety to be able to issue a recall if there's a problem. Um, earlier this year, there was a papaya scare. Um, just a month or two ago, there was a big scare about romaine lettuce. I don't know if any of you have heard of that. Um, Walmart in, in North America has 6,500 stores. And when we went through the romaine lettuce discussion, um, they would have had to pull 6,500 scores worth of romaine lettuce until they could trace back. Um, the mango was a real project. So we did traceability of mangoes from Mexico, specifically, with one of their growers and distributors. And Walmart is one of the best on food trust that is in the world in terms of their supply chain visibility. It took them over six days, almost seven days, to trace the exact farm that that um, package of mangoes came from. We implemented it on a blockchain and got the data from the farm and the packager and the distributor and uh, recorded all that information. And the traceback test on blockchain took two seconds. So he was like, OK, I'm, I'm sold here. This looks like the technology works. But again, this is a network. And you have to get all the participants so that it's not just mangoes that I'm tracing, but romaine lettuce or whatever else comes up. Question? Um, so the security aspect and the trust is a big part on why people are willing to put their information on it, as well as the digitization of that information. You know, so as an example, I also talked to a small um, organic food producer. They have 20 people in their company. Three of them handle paperwork, basically you know, phytosanitary certificates for shipping and packaging, food safety certificates, when was this picked? And with, typically we use a QR code and a, and a little printer to embed more information than you can get, but we're working with GS1, which is the, the guys that have the standards on barcodes, um, to have enough encrypted, uh, contained information for that. So the big part of the trust is I'm actually keeping this data securely in a way that I don't mind having others have it, even if those others, when it's Walmart, could be Kroger or could be some other vendor in the same space. The part on the how do I trace that this is really it is through the flow. So one of the things, in addition to the fact that it took two seconds to trace back, and yes, you could use any database to record that information. They have the record and timestamp all the way through. So they can also detect where it is in a shipper, which they couldn't get from their food trust system. They can intercept those romaine lettuce you know, at the distributor if they trace it to that source in terms of the problem. The original scenario of spinach that we started with um, they basically pulled all spinach off the shelves of everything in the United States. It took over 18 months for the spinach market to recover, um, even though it was traced back to three farms that were adjacent to a pig farm that overflowed in a flood, but went to a packaging facility that mixed it through many, many different vendors. Um, the romaine test that we did actually did a first filter that got from 6,500 stores to 1,900 stores. Still a really big improvement. 
they were able to prove that it was no stores. So they had no recall on that particular issue with that traceability. So the fact that it is immutable and flows through following the chain, now it gets much, much harder. You know, imagine I'm doing palm oil and I'm mixing palm oil. You, you can't solve the fact there that you're going to have to eliminate a whole lot more when you have packaged goods. So McCormick is one of the other uh, companies we're working with. Now imagine chili spice, where you're mixing multiple spices from multiple countries, multiple sources. You have no way but taking the, the superset of that information. But the combination of the security for the trust model for why to participate um, and the traceability is what really tends to make the difference. And it's because of that, you know, Walmart, we thought, would want to do it just for them. And they said, mm -mm, I'm, I'm inviting my competitors. I'm bringing you into GS1, which does the standards. I'm inviting my suppliers. We now have over a dozen folks participating in this, bringing data on board, and largely just for food. But now imagine this extending out on other use cases like tracing provenance of drugs, where drug fraud, drug counterfeiting, and drug theft is a multi-billion dollar issue in the market. And particularly where generics are involved gets to be very problematic. Um, many other you know, use cases, the other one that we've done a lot of work on is with Maersk on global trade. 80% um, of the goods you own and buy touch an ocean at some point in their lifetime. And of that, you know, most of that ocean is done on a container ship. Um, it costs about $2,000 on average to ship a container worth of goods. About um, $200 of that is just in the paper. So your bill of, you know, your bill of lading is your ownership record of that document. So it's always shipped separately. And depending on what the cargo contents are and which trade lanes you go through, it can be massively uh, greater. Um, we did tests with Maersk of flowers from Mombasa to Rotterdam. They had over 200 pieces of communication that were required for a shipment of flowers. And they spent more time in the ports than they did on the ocean with perishable goods, right? So these are low margin perishable goods. If you can take any of that out, you wind up having a very different outcome. There was an estimate by the World Economic Forum that we believe you could take 9 to 14 percent out of inefficiencies in global trade broadly if you could address some of these concerns. So we're not actually handling the shipping and supply chain. We have two, again, we did a test and saw significant improvement in how the handling of that data could be done. And more importantly, right now, even when we ship a computer to someone, we have no visibility through customs. It's an opaque process. We don't know when it's clearing. You know, you can use GPS and you know the ship is in the port, but you don't know if it's been unloaded, you don't know if it's been cleared, you don't know where it is in settling until it actually leaves the gate of the dock. Um, so this notion of paperless trade, how do you digitize all the paper that needs to go with various documents and have more standards on things like a bill of lading or a phytosanitary certificate if it's flowers and other things, and then a shipping information pipeline that's immutable. And again, you know where things are and where they are moving through, which says you've got to get customs, you've got to get Border Patrol, you've got to get others. And again, we now launched a creation of a joint venture in this space because we want everybody to be putting their data on to get some of those efficiencies. And they're spinning up operations in the New York area. And we have about Again, a dozen other participants, shippers, customs and border patrol, ports, terminal operators, who are now getting on board. Um, and once you've now got shipments, you know, then the trade finance piece, that looks very interesting. Doesn't look that way here, I don't know why. Um, 
the trade finance notion, same thing. Um, we've got three or four different efforts, but basically how do you finance consistently for small vendors? Again, usually it's a lot of paper and there is a lot of fraud on a bill of material, which is basically your record that I'm going to give you, lend you money in exchange for the ultimate invoicing of that capital. And if you can reduce time out of that process by having it all digitally exchangeable across a large number of participants, there are nine banks in Europe that are participating in this network facilitating the order to settlement. So, you know, now you got the food producers who are now shipping their goods to the appropriate port in a paperless, digitized fashion who can get financing across that model. And then, how do you get the customs clearance of the currency because now you're you know, trading euros for dollars or what have you. Um, we're doing work with um, Stellar, uh, which, which does have a uh, currency exchange network and ClickX doing an operation in the South Pacific that is physically matching currencies across 13 countries, seven different trade lanes. On average to clear through the normal settlement process today, it takes three to five days. We can do both clearing and settlement using a bridge token in this case to represent the appropriate currency and do it in minutes. So taking out that float um, opportunity. So a lot of different use cases that come down to, we think, biggest areas in supply chain and in the financial association, but they all require permissioning in these networks. So the other big area that we're focusing on is digital identity and how do you know it's you in one of these blockchain networks. We're working with a company out of Canada called SecureKey that has a network of all of the major banks in Canada as well as the government and uh, Rogers Communications on how to verify digitally your identity. Normally when you go into a bank, you, you know, you bring some kind of record certification, you get, um, you have to bring additional documents, but it's usually a physical process. And then how do you replicate that? This is a triple blind system that gives you the ownership of your identity and whoever needs access to confirm a transaction or participation in a network actually request from you the ability to share the information needed to verify your identity for entry, if you will. And it can have some interesting benefits. You know, normally if you're going, I don't know, if you're going to a bar, you bring your, your driver's license to prove you're over 21. There's an awful lot more information on there beyond the fact of your age that you don't need to share but you are sharing just by virtue of the fact that that's the document type that you're using for proof. So how do you actually only provide the information needed for the transaction? Some transactions only need your address. Some transactions, healthcare data need a whole lot more information. How do you uniquely give permission on which data you want for your identity? And there's a whole new project in Hyperledger called Indy which is focused on self-sovereign identity so each individual can create their own record on a blockchain for their identity and have access controlled back by you on who's sharing that information. Instead of using you know, an Experian or someone else as a credit broker is another example where that comes in. In all of these examples, um, there's a couple of different models. They're always networks. They are they are shared, distributed ledgers with networks of some common purpose. And creating consortium-based networks like WeTrade is hard. The technology part is usually faster than the building, the business model around it. Um, our average project has taken about three months. Standing up one of these new ventures, six, nine, 12 months to get them up and operational. Um, there are founder-led networks where an individual company, IBM just did a project, it was our first production project actually, in, trade, in our own global financing business, 
on dispute resolution because most custom financing is a lot of contracts. And when there's a dispute on that contract, you wind up in, with my lawyer and your lawyer reviewing contracts, making phone calls. Average dispute resolution time for us was 44 days. We put the most commonly contested parts of the contract as an actual smart contract on the ledger so everybody could see it directly. Some of it was enforced automatically, so the complaint went away all by itself. In other cases, they could see the data and prove that, oh, it was really the place you shipped the computer to that was where you were you know, creating the, the tax record for, not where you bought it. You know, I signed it here, but I shipped it there, and that's where you know, the tax rate or whatever was calculated, those kinds of things. Since it was our network with our clients, really easy to get people on board. You know, yes, there were benefits to float. We cut that 44 days down to under 10, um, and now could see the benefits there, and we could bring our own participants. But the biggest thing we're starting to see now, I mentioned GS1. SWIFT is, a, is an organization across multiple banks for trading um, cross-currency. They already have a network. They don't have a blockchain, but they already have a network. They already have members. They already have a defined relationship. They already have usually some policy on sharing data. If you can take those, you know, looking for your networks, and take those and make blockchain out of them, you know, that goes pretty far. So that's kind of a view on the landscape. I'm going to spend just a few minutes on um, the technology under the covers. Um, so IBM's strategy in this space is kind of a full stack strategy. It is to get those business benefits at the end of the day that a Walmart or a Maersk or a WeTrade are seeing for their clients. Um, and in that full stack, you know, it starts with the actual distributed ledger. In our case, we're using Hyperledger, primarily Fabric and Composer, but there's nine projects now in Hyperledger. And anybody, we're investing, we've contributed almost five million lines of code into Hyperledger already, along with lots of other people. There were 159 contributors to our, our last update, version one. Um, but we take that code, anybody can take it for free. Yes, we have a support model like you might see in other open source if you want somebody to fix bugs for you or do something like that. But we take all that code, package it up, and create a blockchain as a service cloud platform, which is running on our IBM cloud. And that's the plumbing for creating the network, creating the number of peers, having the certificate authority for the keys because all this data is encrypted, you know, providing the governance model on who's voting on new members to the network. All of the things you need to build, govern, operate a, a network is in here. But the real value is in the solution, the application. Is it food trust? Is it a cryptocurrency? Is it an ICO? Is it you know, trade finance, what is it you're trying to do? We have, through our services team, folks that will help people build one of those smart contracts and build out a network. We have had customers who built their own but came to us and say, I don't want to manage this thing with, you know, now it's getting upwards of dozens of participants. You take care of the, you know, management of the network. And there are some areas like Food Trust where we're actually offering it as an IBM product, if you will. SaaS product for anybody to participate. And then we have a bunch of other things that we're doing in the ecosystem. We have an incubator support program for startups. We have an academic initiative that we provide free access to the platform and our scripts um, for that for teaching purposes. We have um, done an incubator for specific technologies in certain industries. Um, basically trying to both build skills and value-added services and bring them into a marketplace that people can use. And the platform itself, again, has a bunch of different stuff. It takes the Hyperledger cases, but then has all the other pieces that you need to operate that network and activate members and handle the certificate authority and do backup and recovery and how do you keep 
track of now multiple peer nodes and where are they running and how do you distribute that data. And we have three different types of operation, an entry version, pay as you go, um, an enterprise version that runs on our mainframe, actually in the cloud, that has hardware and accelerated encryption and it's FIPS 4 compliant. It basically is an HSM that shuts down if somebody tries to tamper with the data and it eliminates the data. Um, and an enterprise plus where you get a dedicated instance of that. But a lot of interesting computer science and engineering in the network. So now if you get a new version of Fabric and you're running a live production network for hundreds of participants, how do you make updates without taking it down with a distributed ledger? You know, how, how do you do the governance of the certificate authorities for all of the crypto keys? We have a policy that nobody has access to the crypto keys even for our networks. You know, they are distributed. So a whole bunch of policy, a whole bunch of you know, new technology thinking about this as well. And all of this runs on our IBM cloud, which has infrastructure platform and data and AI as a service. So a lot of any one of those networks, most people, you know, the farmer doesn't know they're using blockchain. You know, they've got a QR code reader on a phone, you know, and maybe a little printer if they're an actual producer. They're scanning information as it goes by. Um, so a normal blockchain network is about 25%, 30% blockchain. And everything else is, I've got back-end data integration to get that enterprise data on the mangoes onto my chain. I've got a front-end mobile UI that is the interface to you know, the trader or the grower or whoever. I've got um, integration for new processes, because now the process flow that always went to that central authority, the broker in the middle, is now going to a string of other folks, and your workflow and your automation for the rest of your business probably changed. Um, and a real opportunity for data analytics and AI. A lot of the projects are using machine learning and our Watson capabilities to ingest contracts, real physical paper contracts, and create smart contract code that then becomes the governance mechanism for the solution. So we're tapping into all of these different aspects, and now we're even customizing that further. Um, last year we announced a cloud for financial services, specifically bringing you know, those trade finance solutions, but with the regulatory controls for GDPR and Basel II in the cloud and bringing a whole set of new rapid application development where we've taken, we have something called ALGO that has historical data models of all the financial um, market predictors that now you can get access to and try to drive that. So we're trying to take that vertical view, full stack to a solution, through to other industries. And again, the big ones that we're focusing on, supply chain, financial services, especially those related to the supply chain, healthcare, and government. So that's kind of a quick flyby. Um, happy to take questions or see what you'd like to learn. There's one in the back. So the uh, question was government involvement broadly and, and use cases around voting, gun registry, other things. Yes, 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 and yes. Um, it varies in terms of place. Uh, just a week ago, um, my head of platform presented on a congressional uh, committee panel along with Frank Yanis, the guy from Walmart, and three other experts. Um, on blockchain and what is happening in the space and how might regulatory policy evolve with it. 
There is also a blockchain caucus, which is a joint Congress, Senate, House, and subcommittee, um, which we also presented at just this week here in the US. Um, but every government around the world is taking various postures. You know, some have outlawed Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. Some have outlawed ICOs. Some have embraced it. Japan has actually embraced it. France has embraced it. Um, the government of Dubai has declared all government processes that are shared need to be on blockchain by 2020. Uh, government of Estonia has gone to e-voting on blockchain. Um, so the variation is very broad, country to country. Um, I would say we here are, are learning but slow. No one is objecting and overtly you know, blocking it, but there have been some recent rulings on cryptocurrencies and ICOs in particular from the, from the SEC that are starting to get some attention. And most of it comes down to, is this a cryptocurrency that is value traded or is it not? Is it a security or is it currency? And if it really has fast tradable value, the view is that's less concerning than if it's a security that is an investment. And most people think ICOs will fall in that latter category. Um, there's a company I talked to just last week called Votum that already is using blockchain for voting in non-government uh, elections, like the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which had an issue a couple of years ago of a, you know, a flood bomb of votes uh, that you know, they learned were not legitimate. Um, and they've implemented that as a way of, of getting support. There are a couple of other um, governments that are moving to to that. There's been a discussion of tracking um, guns. There's been a dis there, Canada has um, a bid going right now to track both opioids and they're in the process of legalizing marijuana beyond medicinal use for recreational use. They want to use a blockchain to track uh, and trace, if you will, in that space. So uh, there are, in all of those areas, activity going on. Um, but in general, I think they're participating, but watching. You know, Customs and Border Patrol was a very happy participant, but they're running those chains in parallel to their standard process because there is no regulatory view on it yet. Um, and we think by more adoption, there will be more use. We're doing a lot of work in the healthcare industry. We have a, a project going on with the CDC, much like food safety, of how do you trace quickly outbreak of information. And again, we use a lot of sources beyond blockchain, but if you can record them and share them across agency faster, there is some benefit. And the sharing of confidential data has been a problem. We're also working with the Food and Drug Administration on um, clinical drug trials, again, you typically want many participants in a clinical drug trial, but the sharing of that information gets to be quite problematic, so we have some work going on there as well. And there's a lot being done on counterfeit um, uh, drugs and opioid tracking in various um, places around the world. Mm -hmm. um, so there's been a lot of media coverage. So the question was just what do you think about the media coverage? Um, there is a lot of media coverage. It is obviously a very uh, hyped topic right now and everything is all of a sudden blockchain. I think most of it is centered around um, the hype. Um, particularly around the volatility of things like cryptocurrencies and not all about the actual use cases that are driving benefit. And there are some really good use cases even on the crypto side in terms of access to financing that you know, people without identities, particularly um, folks that are displaced, are getting access to that they didn't have before. 
you know, if, if you are the, the, the DeSapera who are sending 20 bucks a week home to some other country, the cost of the charge of that conversion and that transfer is more than your 20 bucks. You know, so if you can actually get that down, there are a lot of good use cases. Um, most of it is looking, you know, for, for more of the hype um, kind of headlines. So um, a couple of questions there in terms of, um, you know, what do you think about ways to confirm the transaction and new types of consensus mechanisms, proof of stake, um, et cetera. Um, we have, um, there are many mechanisms and it depends what you're using it for, right? Um, so in cryptocurrency and Bitcoin, it really is for the currency that you are solving that double spend problem. I don't really have to worry about double spend of was the mango from this farm, right? I, I'm not talking about worrying about duplicating the mango. So you can take a few liberties in some of these scenarios, um, but rather than the switch from proof of work to proof of stake, we're looking at zero knowledge proof. And you know that's a mechanism that actually further accelerates the time. We just released a paper. I can send it to anybody. It's been published as part of a Cornell proceeding that is taking place in April, um, but it's out now. And we did um, we did an apples to apples comparison, implementing a typical um, Bitcoin kind of consensus model in a tokenized asset that we called fabric coin or fab coin. So we created a fabric coin asset in our blockchain Hyperledger fabric implementation, and then we compared performance. And proof of work in Bitcoin, uh, you know, you capture the number of blocks across the peers. You're, you're pretty much mathematically limited that you're gonna have one update every 10 minutes. It limits you to about seven transactions a second. Um, proof of stake can get much higher, but Ethereum even today is averaging around 15 transactions a second. We've heard proof of stake projects that get it in the hundreds. This particular zero knowledge proof model that we just did on blockchain, on fabric with standard Intel, so we weren't using our mainframe or anything else, um, hit 3,500 transactions per second. You know, so it was, I mean, we're, we're at a 1,000x um, on zero knowledge proof, and we're now talking with Hyperledger on how to contribute that technology. Performance has not been an issue yet in the size of the networks for anything that we've been doing, and you saw some use cases all across the board. Um, I mean, we've done 100,000 transactions on Food Trust already. You know, so that's not the issue yet. We think we'll be able to continue to innovate on top of these models as the performance and scale increases as well. But it's an area of real research. We have our Zurich lab, which is kind of the number one lab on cryptography in the world, working on this with our team. Um, and it's a great area to think about if you're looking for new research. Security cryptography in a blockchain-related world, I think, is going to be pretty hot. Sure. I just have one question. What happens when something goes wrong? The biggest obstacle is um, business model. Um, it is the, you know, so in an Ethereum or a Bitcoin world, you know, it's a very fit for purpose, and the work required to run the network is charged in gas, in Ether, you know, in Ethereum and other things. 
in a permission network which isn't really about cryptocurrency, what is the unit of value and how do you want to monetize that network? It still costs money to run one of these networks. Who's paying for it? Are you creating a legal entity? Is there a membership fee or is there a transaction fee or charge or you know, are you doing this out of the goodness of your heart and everybody's paying you know, some membership? Those questions are the single biggest one. They go great through the pilot and the project, but then taking it to a commercial operation and how they want to handle that with competitors typically in a commercial business operation is the single biggest challenge, which is why we get a lot of law schools involved. We get a lot of MBA schools involved. We see a lot of cross-disciplinary policy, new business model kind of construction work that's going on right now as well. Well, we're excited. Glad to share it. <laughs>